those tools which are used by engineers for various applications. Then we shall look at materials which are called superconductors. The resistivity is almost zero. Uh, we try to understand these materials though we have limitations. We will talk about those limitations in the use of these materials. Some temperature here, let 
policy. So the magnetic field produced is this much, no problem. It is a superconductor. But if I cross this, I reach a value like this, it becomes a normal conductor. It's no longer a superconductor. That means this will depend upon how much current is flowing through the conductor. What is the capacity of the superconductor to carry the current? How much current per unit area of cross section it can carry? It's called the current density. The critical current density is when it uh, turns into a normal conductor, which I'll show you again in the form of a critical current density flowing through the superconductor material. The same thing I've shown here. Uh, here, rather than the magnetic field I produced here, the uh, current density, critical current density, C, stands for critical. And that's the critical value at this temperature. But if the current flows to more than that, it becomes a normal conductor. And if current remains less than that, it is a superconductor. So that causes a limitation on the current carrying capacity of this material. Uh, 
stories, the whole material is being like this. The most accepted theory today is called the BCA theory, Baron Cooper, Shifa, and many of the three scientists who worked for it. They said that there is a three way interaction between two electrons and a phono. I'm just making a very, very brief and very, very simple in Lennon's language. But there are three things. There is a pair form of two electrons, one with a positive spin, other with a negative spin, or you can say one with a positive momentum, other with a negative momentum. The pair is formed. This pair is called a Cooper pair. And this pair is attracted by the positive ion cores which are oscillating above their mean position. At temperature, there is zero carbon, they are oscillating. So there is an attractive force because of this positive ion core and there is a repulsion between these electrons because being the same charge. So there are three things and there are only three way interaction. Interaction between electron 1 and electron 2 in the pair is a repulsive. Electron 1 and the positive ion core attractive. Electron 2 and the positive ion core which is also attractive. So this three way interaction is maintaining these two electrons together as a pair. In other words, the attractive force is more than the repulsive force between the electrons in the superconducting state. It's a very small difference. It's not a very large difference. It's a small difference. However, that difference maintains the two together. And this electron pair is the one which keeps moving. In other words, if you look at this pair as a group, if there is something which is attracting the one in one direction, might be doing the same, applying the force in the opposite direction in the other one. Because in direction motion is different. Opposite other. But the net effect on the coupling will be zero. So one force acting in the positive direction, other acting in the negative direction, net effect on the group is zero. So that pair keeps moving as if no force is applied on the band. As long as they are poor in the form of a pair. So that's what is called a Cooper pair. And there is an attractive interaction energy because as I said with the positive ion core and there is a repulsive energy between them. And attraction gets disrupted when temperature exceeds the critical temperature. These are low temperatures. Then I am talking about the low thermal energy which is disrupting this. So that's what I said. The difference between attraction and repulsion is very small. The attraction is more than the repulsion. Well, that's what is happening, and this is, I can summarize in simple words, what the BCS theory is about. So, what happens about TC? About TC, the repulsion between the electrons is more than the attraction of the positive ion course, no? Because they are also now oscillating with more vigorous nature, no? And therefore, they are not able to put the same effect on the two electrons, what they were doing at a lower temperature. Now, the second thing about this phenomenon, which I want to say is, there are two types of superconductors. One is called type 1, where I said there is a perfect diamagnet the susceptibility being minus 1. So, M, which is equal to tau H, we apply minus M versus H, slope is 1. It goes up to a critical field, beyond which it becomes a normal conductor and susceptibility falls down close to zero. Even if it is a dielectric material, it is not going to be minus one. It is perfect diamagnet only in the superconductive state. So it comes to a very small value, maybe minus one times the power minus three or minus five. Right? That is where it reaches, which is close to zero. And there is a sudden drop and material becomes a normal conductor. It is a particular magnetic field. But there is second kind of superconductors, which are called type 2 superconductors, where instead of this happening at a critical field,
be like in the type 1, the process of becoming normal takes place over a range of magnetic field. It doesn't take place at a single magnetic field value. So this one is called lower critical field, I call it HC1, it's upper critical field, we call it HC2. Between HC1 and HC2 is called the vortex region. This is how the uh, susceptibility is decreasing, you know, it starts to decrease from 1, goes down, 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 down and it is almost a 0 value at upper critical field. Between critical field 1 and between critical field 2, material is still going to behave like a superconductor. What is happening is, Nominative lines of free are going through the material slowly. In other words, there is a volume of the material which is allowing the magnetic lines of force to pass through it, or another volume which is not allowing it to pass through it. And this volume is decreasing slowly as the critical uh, or the magnetic field is increasing. This keeps on decreasing. It is a situation you can consider as two conductors in parallel. One is a good conductor, other is a poor conductor. What shall be the resistivity of such a material? Such a combination. So, the resistance we will obtain will be less than the resistance and the lower resistance. Is it? This is in parallel. So, then try to continue to behave like a superconductor. This material, right? One of them is current carrying capacity might decrease. Because the volume through which the current can pass through, the superconducting current can pass through, is, is, is going to become smaller and smaller till you reach here. So, this, and from the engineering point of view, this is the material which you can manipulate the vortex region. And also, the upper critical field becomes very high for such materials. Therefore, the current carrying capacity can also become very high for such materials. Here, it is in, in the superconducting state. Yeah, that, that's of course, that's of course, I uh, only said that the magnetic field produced at critical temperature, a small value is good enough to make a normal conductor. But I'm below the critical temperature, well, you need a high value. So it's always that when in the superconducting state, I'm below the critical temperature, the material when I'm putting to use as a superconductor, and that's some temperature you are talking about. No, I cannot do that. So, this is this critical temperature, we what we are talking about is below the critical temperature, whatever the critical temperature of the material, that's the material property, we will come to that, we will talk about it. This is a material where type 2 superconductor is of great practical interest because of its ability to carry high current density or carry higher currents. Yes, yes, they can lose below TC, they can lose their current superconductivity in nature. That's what I uh, showed you with the how much current it can through the conductor or what magnetic field you put it in, you know, that, that can make it a uh, normal conductor. What can happen? Yes, even if the TC even if you small small current passes through it makes it a magnet, yes, it will lose. Yes. So when you build a TC that you can use it as a superconductor. Now, here the practical importance for engineers is that I can manipulate the microstructure and this condition of the vertex region is decided by the microstructure 
of the material. I 
time itself plan within the game. Okay? It's about 10 by 7. In fact, of a magnitude, two orders of magnitude. Difference between this and this. And covalent and precipitation order is 10 to the power 8. Another order of magnitude increase. So this is can be done in Niagara titanium. Upper critical field is enhanced. Basically, the current carrying capacity has gone up. Thank you. 
the suction junction. And once the conductivity of this current begins to flow, it's been insulated, this layer has been made so thin that the electrons which pass through the superconductor before they can collide and fall down, they cross this region and go into the other region and keep flowing. This kind of material, but this current should be a certain value. For less than that, it is not able to. So its behavior would be something like this. For current, uh, let's say apply the voltage. This is the current. For the current value up to this, nothing happens. On the voltage, you apply this. But beyond that, it behaves like this. So. When you reduce this voltage which you applied, at this this current will keep flowing because it's a superconducting current and come down to zero only when you have completely reduced the voltage. So it is working like a switch at this voltage. It's just working like a switch. That's what I said. And the switching timings can be as small as 10 picosecond. That is 10 to the power minus 11 seconds and I will tell you that even this is more than the moon collision time in conductors that we talked about as a zero to 10 minus 13 seconds and this is more 10 to minus 11 is 10 100 times more than that right but we cannot have better than that this is possible to have this the application of the superconducting material but I should be able to have superconductors which can work at the temperature uh, using them. Then another kind of application is levitation. If there is a magnetic field and any object which you put there, the magnetic material is in a magnetic field, it will be floating. That's why it's called levitation. And that can be exploited in, in transportation, high speed trains the bullet train, you are out of. That kind of an application it can be put to. Train will be floating over the magnetic field only. When you have stopped the magnetic field, it will only fall down. So it can travel at very fast speeds. But that kind of a levitation is required at the temperature we are working at the mean temperature. Now that's the restriction which we have on the application of these materials. Then it is also possible for me to use it for long distance transmission of power. And I score our loss will be almost nil. Alright. We have a problem of temperature, that's what I'm going to show here. Where we can use it. One of the material which we need, I showed an example of Nabin titanium alloy, it's a Nabin germanium alloy. Minus the critical temperature, 23 Kelvin, and this was our knowledge till 1986. Of course, I showed you the first one, the tin, which was at 4 Kelvin. This is 23 Kelvin. And then in 1986, oxides, which are normally supposed to be insulators, lanthanum, barium, copper oxide, produced 34 Kelvin. It's a Nobel Prize winning discovery. Okay. That's a great jump from 23 Kelvin to 34 Kelvin. But then in our two years time came another material which is called a 1, 2, 3 compound. Of course, there are a number of such compounds, similar compounds. Here the critical temperature is 90 Kelvin. And this is a kind of a breakthrough. We have come down from boiling temperature of the liquid helium to the boiling temperature of the liquid nitrogen, okay, which is about 78, 90 is higher than that. Okay. So we have come down to this temperature of 90 Kelvin and yttrium barium copper oxide is called as a 1, 2, 3, because yttrium is only 1, barium are 2 and copper are 3. Why it is called 1, 2, 3 compound? Oxide 
Indians have their own problems, but if it is there in Niagara Canyon, liquid nitrogen can be made available in abundance and probably can be used. Let's see. What is this one, two, three compound? How do we make it? And what is the structure? And how can I use it? Well, the recipe for making it in barium compound, the number of things which are patents and therefore they are not available. Still, by and large, we need petroleum oxide, Y2O3, like Y2O3, barium carbonate, and copper oxide. But mix them in the right proportion in the form of powder, compact them, and heat it between 900 and 1100 degrees centigrade. I don't know what exact temperature it is. Barium carbonate decomposes in this temperature range to form barium oxide and carbon dioxide. So, because I don't want carbon dioxide here, I need oxygen, nitrogen, barium, and copper. So, this is carbon dioxide goes away. Then it is annealed at 800 degrees centigrade. It's mined and under it in oxygen atmosphere. Partial pressure of oxygen is a must. What is that value? I don't know. That's necessary for it to happen. When it is annealed at that temperature, the sintering process and the coming to the right composition takes place. Now, this superconducting property in this material, this oxide which is made, seems to be a very sensitive function of the oxygen content. And therefore, of the partial pressure of oxygen during heat treatment, that's the heat treatment I'm referring to the annealing at 800 degrees centigrade. From there, it is taken to the room temperature very rapidly and kept there, and you can use it below room temperature as a superconductor. So this is what is important, the partial pressure of oxygen. And you will recall that what I said was the composition of this is yttrium, barium 2, copper 3, oxygen, as it's 7 minus x, x is a fraction, x is a small fraction. Oxygen is less than 7. But from here, you will notice that you would get more oxygen than we need. So, that partial pressure of oxygen is required to maintain the correct composition, which is superconducting in nature. This is a crystal structure. This crystal structure I am showing us is actually orthorhombic, to be very frank with you. A is different from B and C is very long. But A and B are not very different. So, just to show you this, I have made the unit cell as composed of three cubes. C is about three times of A and B. A and B are slightly different from each other. But it is orthorhombic, very speaking. So here I have in this one cube, consider any cube for that matter, there are three cubes, cube number one, cube number two, and cube number three. I have the positions, the eight corners of the cube, each cube. I have the location, the body center of the cube. I have the location, which are the out centers of the cube. I am not using any face center. This is copper which is at each corner. Each corner of a cell, cubic cell, which I am showing, gives you effectively one. I think that three cubes, one, two, three. So three copper. You turn the in copper oxide, one, two, three copper, I mean three, there are three. Alright. This is it here. In the center, body center, or the middle cube. There is only one among three. There is only one. So, 
this I've got 3 and this I've got 1. This is barium. Where the centers of the two cubes? Other two cubes, where the tm is there other than that. Barium, barium. So there are two of them. In 1, 2, 3, atm, barium, copper. 1, 2, 3, are And so the oxygen. All the eight centers are oxygen. If all the eight centers are oxygen, what happens? In a cube, each eight center gives you what? One by four. And the twelve such as this, they give me three. And three cubes like this, nine. So I get nine. I need seven minus x. That will be three and more in copper oxide, there should be oxygen, should be seven. Need seven minus x. So what happens is, these are the locations like this, one and two here. Then in this one, two, three, and four here. And this again, one and two. These locations do not have oxygen. I'm this dot it. These locations do not have oxygen. How many of these locations? Four and four. Eight by four makes it two. So two of the oxygen are not there, so that makes it nine minus two, seven oxygen. So the location is that two of them here, four in the middle here, four here, then this none here, then the four here, and the four there, and the two here. Those are the uh, locations for the oxygen used. But in this unit cell, which is the atomic unit cell, oxygen you will find. This is at center, this is at center, but on this edge, long edge, you have two of them, one here, one there, one here, one there, as you see, one here, one there, right? And if you look at this axis, on this axis, you have in this face, uh, in the middle of the face, these two locations, same way at the back, you see? So this is, these are the locations of the oxygen, which makes it 7. But I need 7 minus x, x is a fraction. Some of these oxygen should be not be there. They should be providing uh, vacant space, a vacant location for oxygen. We will find that there is enough space for oxygen to be sitting there, but those are not utilized by oxygen. So this is the crystal structure of the 1, 2, 3 compound. Solid is deformed, dislocations move, and a dislocation comes out. 
new surface, energy is lost, this energy is shown up by the material as heat, the temperature of the material rises. Don't believe me, take a piece of iron, a boy iron nail, hit it with the hammer few times and touch the nail, you will find that it will become hot. Because the dislocation which goes out the surface loses that energy, maybe squared by two per unit length of the dislocation line. And that energy is goes waste as heat. And that material absorbs that heat and uh, temperature rises. So the heat which is generated during the forming operation, or which is sometimes required if you want to do it at a little elevated temperature, deteriorates the proper reciprocating properties, may not be reciprocating at all. That's very important. So reactive that even in a room with small humidity, oxide will lose all its character as a superconducting material. Small absorption of high water in the oxide in the human atmosphere will make it uh, insulator, which is in which it is insulator. Oxides are all insulators and it's not a superconducting material at all. But we have slowed that we are keeping idle. We have realized this material. How do we go about using this material? So a number of attempts have been made, and some attempts have been made very successfully. One of them is the explosive farming. In explosive farming, pressures of the order of 50,000 atmosphere are generated. And this is done in such a sudden manner, the temperature rise is not more than 100 degrees centigrade. Temperature doesn't rise. Explosive it is, so it is done in a very sudden manner. And these stresses in the material are generated because of the explosion of shock waves created, and these shock waves produce these stresses inside the material. Do that, then what is possible is, when tempted, This is a copper, ca uh, copper casing. In the copper casing, you fill your superconducting powder or oxide material and put in a chamber where you do the explosion. Because of the pressure generated, this will get compacted and a copper casing will get joined automatically to this oxide. Now outside you can put your conductor wires because copper you can join with the copper wire with the help of solder and when you do the solding again the temperature doesn't rise beyond 183 degrees centigrade. You know that's the eutectic temperature you may go about 8 degree or 2 more about that and then the material can be joined and can be used as a part of a circuit. That attempt has been made and this has been successful. Thin copper casing and material inside gets automatically during that pressure, that kind of pressure. And a similar thing can be done with isostatic pressing. It is not explosive forming but isostatic pressing. Isostatic means it is the pressure is seen in all directions, like what you have in, uh, let's say, liquid medium. At any point, you will find the pressure to be seen in all directions. That kind of a thing is done. And when the forming is done with the isostatic pressing, similar effects are produced, like in the explosive forming. Okay? And it's possible for us to not only, this I encase it in copper, the it is going to join to the copper automatically. Secondly, I am avoiding its coming in contact with the normal atmosphere, the ambience. So it is unable to come in contact with the ambience, that means the humidity is not going to affect it. Because it is being encased already in a, in a uh, some kind of a copper shell, a 
has been encased. I've not in contact with the atmosphere at all. So that's kind of a thing I've been trying, but it has to be exploited for applications which require a large amount of this material and the form of wire, in the form of uh, strips, and so the conduction effect can be, or the conducting component can be made out of this material. Right. So these are the limitations with which we are still working, and we hope that soon we are able to come up with something which can be used at room temperature without requiring the use of liquid nitrogen. Thank <laughs> you.